This is an Old Testament, what they call one of the Old Testament prophets. There's about 12 of them. And Micah is one here. And uh, tonight, I'm going to give you not just an overview of this little book of seven chapters, uh, but I'm going to give you the prophetic and, and um, historical uh, meaning of the book of Micah. Sometimes you read these little books in the Old Testament and you have no idea in the world where you're at, what you're doing, what you're reading about, what's going on, or nothing. Maybe I can, I can help you with that just a little bit tonight. Micah. Everybody got it? All right. The book of Micah. We're looking at it? Micah. M-I-C-A-H. Only seven chapters toward the end of the Old Testament. Seven chapters, 105 verses, 3,100 52 words. The name of the prophet Micah, the Morishite, what the Bible calls him there in verse 1. And that was a town, uh, an area in which he lived. Like uh, somebody be from a certain part of the country and you call him a, a Floridian or something like that, you know, the Mor Morishite. Uh, the name Micah means who is like Jehovah. All those Old Testament prophets, most of them, their name meant things in Hebrew. So uh, that's what his name meant. His preaching was during the reign of three of Israel's kings in the Old Testament. That would be uh, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. Uh, Jotham was a, a, a good king. Ahaz was a bad king. And Hezekiah was a sort of okay sort of a king. And 750 to 700 B.C. Remember, you're going backwards. When you say 600 B.C., 700 B.C., 600, uh, 700 happened before 600 because you're going backward. You know, you're going 700, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, Jesus born on the cross, then 1, 2, 3, starts going the other way. So it, it can trick your mind a little bit when you start thinking about these uh, B.C. numbers. So he was the sixth prophet raised up by God to tell Israel that they're in trouble. The nation of Israel. And he's telling them to repent or just get wiped out. It's up to them. Uh, he preached to both. The kingdom had split. And this was, this was before 5, 9, 80, 90, whatever it was, when Nebuchadnezzar took Israel captive. So all this stuff in the Old Testament is happening. And this is 200 years nearly before the captivity. And all these prophets are saying, you're going to get it. You're going to get it. Israel, I'm warning you. God's tired of this mess. God's tired. And Micah was one of these guys. Raised up saying, you're going to get it. You're going to get it. And they got it. They got it. And uh, Nebuchadnezzar let them captive. Then they come back, and the, the temple was destroyed. And uh, it's still been destroyed. That was the, the uh, uh, first temple. Then they, they come back and build another one. Uh, and that was destroyed in 70 AD. That was the second temple. Temple, and that's why you hear people talk about the third temple, the third temple, the third temple that will be built one day in Jerusalem. Now, I'm, when I get into this tonight, I'm going to touch on a lot of stuff that's political, and there's no, there's no way around it. It's impossible. You cannot separate them Old Testament prophets from the political state of Israel and the nations around them any more than you can separate real Bible preaching. I know there's a lot of preachers that sort of like to hide and stay under the radar and say, well, we're just going to tell people that God loves them and we're just going to tell people other about it. Now, you can do that, but you're chickening out. There is no way in the world that a preacher can preach the Bible and not fly right into the face of the whole world system and political system. It's impossible. cannot be done. It cannot be done. We didn't start this mess. They did. We didn't jump in on them politicians. They jumped on us in our Bible. We're just fighting back and taking up for it. Now, I will say some things about Israel, the nation of Israel. Uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of comments you hear on YouTube and uh, TikTok and all these things. I, I will warn you again. I warned you a bunch of times and I will warn you again. You cannot believe everything people put on there. And I, I, that's been proven over the last few years. All this coronavirus stuff and everything. Some of it was true. Some of it was an exaggerated mess. So you can't, you can't, I know, I know there's a lot of preachers that say, how in the world can you even pray for Israel? They're not really even Israel anyway. They're a bunch of backslid heathen that hate God. And, and that is true. 
There, there a lot of them are not true blue Jews uh, in the flesh anymore. And, uh, and they say, well, how could you even support them? Uh, again, and, and here's what we do. It doesn't matter how many perverts are in Jerusalem. It doesn't matter how many unbelievers and atheists they are in, in Jerusalem and Israel. We preach what the Bible says about them. That's the difference. No matter what the TV says or what they do. It's what does. And if, and if a lot of people spend more time in their Bible and less time on the news, they might be a whole lot better off. Now, tonight, uh, this, this prophet, the, the, the kingdom split, the southern part was Judah. You know, you read the Old Testament, it'll say Judah. Little uh, hard to understand. Problems of Israel. The problems of Israel. The problem that Israel had in the Old Testament, and then I'm going to compare it to the problem we have now. Now, I do not believe that the church replaced Israel. That's replacement theology, and they say that God's all done with the Jews and Israel forever, and now we are the Jews. Now, we are spiritual sons of Abraham, but they are still physical, literal sons of Abraham. Real Jews are. A uh, man said to me one time, he said, uh, now you tell me how in the world the Lord's going to have 144,000 uh, Jewish virgin young men and they're all from 12 tribes of Israel. Ain't no trouble for the Lord. If, if he can't find them, he'll raise them up. He'll raise them up. There's a bunch of scriptures that hint at that. Uh, back there in the Old Testament, there's only bones there. And he said, can these bones live? And he prophesied, and they come up, buddy. And they come up and become a mighty army. And then the Lord told them one time, they said, uh, he said, you know, see these rocks right here? God's able to these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Why did he say that? There's a reason he said that. He wasn't just talking. And so there, there, there will be 144,000 Jewish male virgins who preach during the Great Tribulation. They are not Jehovah Witnesses. But the Jehovah Witnesses are not Jewish and most of them are not virgins. And they, uh, they, they are, uh, you say, well, you believe that literally? Absolutely. Absolutely. He even tells the tribes, uh, 12,000 from each tribe. So be careful of what you see on, on YouTube. Uh, they, can, they, can, they can twist anything, make anything sound right nowadays. Uh, they, so some of it's right, a lot of it ain't. So tonight, look at chapter 1, and we see the problem of idolatry. You're looking at Micah chapter 1 and verse 2. Spiritually to us, literally to them. Hear ye, all ye people, hearken, O earth, and all that is therein. Let the Lord God be witness against you. The Lord from his holy temple. The Lord come down out of his place. He'll come down, tread upon the high places of the earth. Look at here, second advent. This prophetically has not happened yet. And the mountains shall be molten under him, and the valleys shall be cleft, as wax before the fire and the waters that are poured down a steep place. Now look at here. Here's what you've got to understand when you study prophecy. The prophet is looking to people right then. He's saying, thus saith the Lord. This is going to happen. That's going to happen. And it literally does. But his word also goes way on past there for thousands of years sometime. And a lot of it ain't happened yet. Now, remember that when you're studying Scripture. It, it, you say, well, why does God make it so confusing so them fools can't understand it? He wants he, people that are sincere to understand it. He don't want ever, ever nut in the world just open the Bible and say, oh, well, this is going to happen. Da, 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 da. He, put, he deliberately hides it so that you've got to dig it like gold and silver and buried treasure. That's what the Lord does. And he make, that way he finds out who's sincere. Now, it's not poetic. It's not symbolic. The, the mountains will literally melt one day at his coming. And the Bible said the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. And God tells them that. Look at verse number 6. Therefore I'll make Samaria as a heap of the field and the plantings of a vineyard. I'll pour down the stone there in the valley. I'll discover the foundation. Verse 7. And all the graven images thereof shall be beaten to pieces. Well, they still got them tonight. So it was more than just back then. And all the hires thereof shall be burned with the fire. And all the idols thereof will I lay desolate. Listen, right now in Jerusalem, 
It's spiritually called Sodom and Egypt in the Bible. Homosexuality is rampant all over Jerusalem right now. Don't, don't, don't ever get, when we, when we say pray for Jerusalem, don't ever get the idea that we think they're right with God. They're not. They're not even Christians. They're not even, they don't believe in Jesus. They, you say, well, why does God believe? Because of that promise that he made to Abraham back in the Old Testament to bless him and his seed. That's a complicated thing, but you've got to understand that. God don't take care of them because they're right with God. That's why they're having all this trouble. One reason why Israel's always been bombed and Jerusalem been tore up so many times and bombed is because they rejected the Messiah when he come and they said his blood be on us and on our children. And buddy, there it came. I'm telling you, they've had it ever since. So God's been punishing them like he's using Hamas right now to allow Israel to be punished. But don't ever think for a second that God's forgot them people. Amen. He's not. We'll see that in a minute. Now, uh, so he said in verse 7. Look at verse 7. And uh, their idols will be burned with a fire. And I'll lay desolate. For she gathered into the hire of a harlot. And they shall return to the hire of a harlot. Oh, uh, my goodness, my goodness. Is that the United States or what? You see the parallel? Parallel, God says, hey, you ain't nothing but a bunch of idol worshipers. You've set up your idols. You quit worshiping me a long time ago. I'm tired of this. I'm going to get you. I'm going to get you. He said that to Israel, spiritually speaking. It's the United States of America. And we could take the same warning from God. If God wouldn't let his people in the Old Testament get by with being harlots and, 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 and selling sex for money and worshiping idols, then don't think for a second God's going to smile on the United States of America and let us get by with it either. That's a spiritual application. Chapter 2. Chapter 2. Look at chapter 2 and verse 1. Woe to them that devise iniquity. And work evil upon their beds. Anybody in here been working evil on your bed? When the morning is light, they practice it because in the power of their hand. So now I'll cut you down. But what he's what he's saying to Israel is you guys lay around in the bed at night and plot and plan and connive and work business deals. And figure out how to get people's land. And figure out how to cheat people out of their money. And how to hook and crook. And all the way through the Bible. And I'm going to say this to all y'all people. You people that do business. You people that sell sell cars or whatever. I don't know if we got a car dealer in here or not. But uh, just anything like that. You better be careful of hooking and crooking people. Because the Lord in heaven is watching everything you say and do. And if you cheat a little here, oh, I deserve it. And you cheat a little there because oh, they don't need it. And you say, the Lord said, you better make sure that you're doing people right and that you do people because the Lord is the judge and the avenger. They practice. They sit around on their bed at night and they think, well, I believe I can go over there and I can get that piece of property. And I believe, that's what Hitler did. That's what all them great uh, famous wicked leaders did. That's what politicians do. They lay around at night and uh, poor old Joe, if I can wake him up long enough, he might think up something uh, he could do uh, to, to mess somebody up. But uh, he, he's got people thinking for him. And uh, they lay around on their bed at night and devise evil. And that is not good. Plotting how to take people's land and raise their taxes and make deals with China and figure out how to make money and, and not lose like that. Amen. He said, woe unto them. Look at here. In verse number 7. Chapter 2 and verse number 7. O thou that art named the house of Jacob. Is the spirit of the Lord straightened? Are these his doings? Do not my words do good to him that walketh uprightly? What a verse hid back there in the Old Testament. What a great verse. Grab a hold of that verse. The word of God will help you and bless you. If you'll live right and honor it. Listen. This book's still true. And if you'll live right every day. These words will help you. That's what he's saying. Now. Let's move. Got a long way to go here. Chapter 3. Chapter 3, we see their deception. Chapter number 3 now, deception by the prophets. You're going to see a bunch of crooked, low-down, money-grabbing preachers that just preach for money and food in their mouth. Look at chapter 3. Uh, the deception by the prophets. Look at chapter number 3. Oh, let's see here. Uh, look at verse number... Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, verse 3, they eat the flesh of my people, flay their skin, moth them, they break their bones.
chop them in pieces as for the pot and the flesh within the cauldron. Then shall they cry and hide his face from them at that time. Now, look here at five. The Lord concerning the prophets that make my people err, that bite with their teeth and cry peace, and he putteth not into their mouths, they even prepare war against them. That means all them prophets, all they preached for was something to go in their mouth. You feed me, you take care of me, you give me a nice house to live in, you drive me a nice car, and we'll sweep everything else under the rug, and everything will be cool. And God said they preach for money, they preach for the gain of their mouth, and God said they tell people peace, peace, when there is no peace. Verse 6, Therefore night shall be unto you. Ye shall have a vision, and it will be dark unto you, and shall not divine. The sun shall go down over the prophets, and the day shall be dark over them. Then shall the seers, that's an Old Testament word for like a prophet, seer, somebody can see in the future. Uh, a shame, the diviners confound it, and they'll cover their lips. And um, But look at the difference in them and Micah. Here's the difference between a real man of God and a fake. We'll preach for money, a fake preacher, and to get a bunch of money and people coming in, Here's what Micah did. But truly, I am full of power by the Spirit of the Lord. Ladies and gentlemen, our need today is just like what they had in them days. These Old Testament, them old fake prophets, they're saying, hey, everything's all right. We ain't going to be invaded. Y'all, everything's cool. The Lord knows. We're offering our sacrifices. Everything's all right. Just keep the money coming in. Old Micah stands up and he said, no, it ain't going to happen. I'm full of power by the word of the Lord. Ladies and gentlemen, what we need is our generation. What we need more than anything, what we need. People ask me a lot of times, they say, Brother Danny, uh, uh, she, they say, man, you stay in the study a lot. You stay in the study a lot. And it ain't that I'm looking for something to say. I've got plenty to say. But what I'm trying to do is get the power. What we need is the power. What to get a hold of our kids the power. What to get a hold of our teenagers the power. Listen, brother, what our teenagers need at, at youth camp and youth rally and winter camp is the power. He said, I'm full of power by the Spirit of the Lord. Preachers, when y'all get up to preach, it's good to know a lot. It's good to say a lot. But more than anything, just say, God, let me be full of power by the Spirit of the Lord. That's what he was saying to them. Look here what these bunch of hypocrites did. They thought, well, I'm cool. I got the doors open. I dress nice. They all like me. I got a good personality. I can tell some funny stories. I'll get famous. I'll get popular. Yeah, whatever. We don't need a bunch of fakes like that. The head, verse 11, judge for reward, and the priest thereof teach for hire. They're preaching for money, and the prophets divine for money. Yet will they lean upon the Lord and say, is not the Lord among us? None evil can come upon us. He's out there preaching for money. And they'll lean and say, the Lord's among us. Ain't nothing bad going to happen. And all kind of bad stuff was fixing to happen. So Micah will be accused of being doom and gloom. Negative. Oh, it's always been like that. Noah's day. Paul's day. The po they're always cute. Why can't you ever just talk good? Why don't you just talk about the positive? Why is it always negative? Every prophet in the Bible was getting negative, 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 because it is negative. Look at chapter 3. Look at verse 8. He's full of power. That's what we need. Now, chapter 4. Chapter 4, we see some prophecy. Um, it jumps back and forth into the millennium. The 1,000 years reign on this earth. Now you read it both ways. It was for them immediately. It's prophetically out there in the future and has not happened yet. Look at chapter 4. But in the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountain and it shall be exalted above the hill and the people shall flow unto it. That has not happened yet. And many nations shall come and say, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. That's Mount Zion. Right there in Jerusalem. And to the house of the God of Jacob. Not Ishmael. Not Muslims. Jacob. The son of Israel. And he will teach of his ways and will walk in his path. For the law shall go forth of Zion. The word of the Lord from Jerusalem. 
And he shall judge among many people. Look at it. Look at it. And rebuke strong nations. Hezbollah. Iraq. Iran. Far off. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares. And their pruning hooks. We don't need these swords no more. You remember the old people used to say this? They thought that it was a, in, in peace in the United States. They didn't understand it. Look at, look at the last part of verse 3. Nations shall not lift a sword against nation. Has that happened yet? No. That's future. Neither shall they learn war anymore. Has that happened? Of course not. You say, what are you talking about back then? They're still learning war right now. They're over our training right now how to kill each other. There is coming a day when they'll not study war anymore. And they'll beat their sword. And, and like I had a knife. Well, I don't need that no more to kill nobody. I'll just make me a, I'll just make me a plowshare out of that. And work in my garden. And everything's great. And the old timer you'd say, ain't going to study war no more. Ain't going to study war no more. Ain't going to study war no more. That's where it come from, that verse right there. They didn't understand it. But that's future. That's future during the millennium. Now, notice how when you study prophecy in the Bible, this might sound confusing, but I'm trying to make it as plain as I can and just hit the high spots in this book. Sometimes prophecy will jump. Prophecy will have the first coming and the second coming both in one verse. I'll show you two of them here in just a minute. So that's where the Jews missed his first coming. They, when they come the first time, they thought, well, he ain't set up no kingdom. We're looking for the kingdom. Where's the kingdom? Notice what that when's the kingdom? He come and preached the kingdom of heaven's at hand. But they rejected him and said, Where's the kingdom? So he gets crucified and nailed on the cross. They say, Well, that couldn't have been him. When our Messiah comes, he'll set up a kingdom. And they're still looking for him. When the Antichrist comes, they'll think that's the Messiah. And he'll make the deal. And then they'll find out he ain't. And he'll go in the abomination of desolation, sit on the on the, on the temple there, in the in like they said in Daniel chapter 9. And then they're going to run out of Jerusalem down there to that red rock city, and God's going to feed them maybe with manna like he did in the Old Testament, just like he did again. I'll show you that here in just a minute. Big things are in store for the Middle East. Amen? I'll show you where old Hamas lives here in just a second. Stay with me. Stay with me tonight. Don't, don't. Don't just give up and say, I can't understand this and give up. Stay with me. Look at, look at, uh, look at chapter 4 and verse 3. That is definitely the millennium. They'll sit ever under man, his vine tree and his fig tree, and none shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Period. It ain't happened yet, but it's going to. Look at verse 10. Be in pain, labor to bring forth, O daughter of Zion. Like a woman in travail. Over there in Revelation chapter 11, 12. Thou shalt go forth the city. Thou shalt dwell in the field. Thou shalt go into Babylon. There shalt thou be delivered. And there the Lord shall redeem thee from the hand of thine enemies. When all them countries surround Jerusalem, the Lord will one day deliver them. I, tell you, I don't, can't take the time to, to, to get into all of that. But uh, look, at, uh, that, look at verse number 11. Now also many nations are gathered against thee. Is that happening today? Many nations are gathered against thee. You know, there's an all-out effort right now to turn everybody against Israel. Right now. They're trying their best. Then Ed McAbee, my mentor, one of my great mentors, he always said, he said, if America ever takes side against Israel, we signed our death warrant. Now, I'm not supporting their lifestyle. I know they're wicked. They are enemies for our sake. But beloved for the Father's sake. That's what you don't, that's what the news don't understand. You know what them nuts on the news think? They think, well, they've been fighting over this for 75 years and you really can't blame them Palestinians because Israel is occupying that land. You hear the occupation, you hear the occupation. And our president and the Democrats, every one of them sing the same song. They sing, the answer to all this problem is a two-state solution. That's what they all say. You hear that every day on the news. The, answer, the only way we're ever going to make peace is to give Israel high fat land and the Palestinians high fat land. They, they have no idea what they're talking about. That has never worked and it will never work. Because the Palestinians are taught. They teach your kids when they're that high to learn to go in them tunnel, to shoot guns, to wage warfare. They are taught 
that Israel can never have one bit of that land. And here's the Jews saying, no, God gave us this land. Back before y'all ever got here, he gave it to our father Abraham. And that war, there ain't going to be no answer to that war till the Prince of Peace comes and fixes that mess one of these days. That's it. That's it. What makes me an expert? I ain't. But I've got a book that is. Amen. I'm not a history expert. I'm not a, I'm not a political expert. I've got a Bible. And that's what the Bible says. Now, look here. All right. Chapter number five. Look at chapter number five. Remember what I told you about prophecy? This is probably the most well-known verse in the book of Micah. This verse makes Micah famous. This verse is quoted more than any other verse in the book of Micah. Where he, he gets in the spirit and he prophesies. Look at verse 2. It's Christmas time. Here it comes. But thou, Bethlehem, Ephratah. That's the area, uh, township around where Bethlehem. Though thou be little among the thousands. Little bitty town. Oh, little town of Bethlehem. Yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel. Whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. Lord have mercy. That is the most quoted. Well, uh, Micah, 600 years before it happened, in the Spirit says, Bethlehem. That's one way you know the Bible's Word of God. He's talking all this political stuff, and all of a sudden he starts prophesying. And it happened. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. It happened. That's God showing you the Old Testament's true. It's, it's a proven fact. This was wrote 600 years before he came. Here some, Jesus shows up in Bethlehem. Let me show you something. Take your Bible and turn to Matthew chapter 2. You're just saying. This will help you. It's Christmas time. Uh, this will help you. Look here. When them wise men came to King Herod, you know what they done? You know what them boys are doing there? They've been reading their Old Testament. They've been reading. Look here in Matthew chapter number 2. And here, when the wise men came and saw a star. Now get this now. You can show it to your kin folks. Maybe some of them don't believe the Bible. This will help you. Dig. Dig in there a little bit. You're, you're smart enough to get this. Don't let the devil tell you, well, you're just a dumb person. You'll never get it figured out. You're, everybody in here is smart enough to get this. Look. When they came, they came to Bethlehem because they saw a star. King Herod heard about it and he's scared. Verse 3. They gathered all of them together where Christ to be born. And they said, Bethlehem of Judea. Look at verse 5. For thus it is written by the prophet. Somebody tell me what prophet he's talking about. Micah. Micah. It is written by the prophet. And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah. For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. So there's the wise men at Bethlehem quoting the Old Testament saying the reason we're here, Micah the prophet said, this would happen, and here he is. Now, lest somebody, there's always somebody that says, well, he might have just been talking about uh, a normal person. Uh-uh, uh-uh. Look, at, look back at our text now. Look back at chapter 7. Look back at chapter 7. Um, I'm sorry, chapter 5, I'm sorry. Chapter 5, look back at chapter 5, and verse number 2. It said, out of these shall come forth he to be ruler of Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. So whoever he's talking about, was not a normal person. He had been from everlasting. See that? You see that? Stuff like that's in the Bible to nail it down. Nail it down. Nail it down. The average person in, that works for CBS and NBC don't even know that's in the Bible. Me and you sitting here tonight, we have light. We The light's on in here. Now, I ain't talking about them light. The light's on in our soul, in our mind. We can see Micah the prophet saw Christ being born. He said, this ain't no normal man. Isaiah said his mom's a virgin. That ain't never happened before. Uh, Micah said he'd come to Bethlehem. So he's born in Bethlehem and he wasn't normal. His goings forth from everlasting. <whistles> what a verse. Oh, little town of Bethlehem. 700 B.C. Never had a beginning. He never had an ending. His life was from everlasting. Chapter 6. Let's look at chapter number 6. Here in this little book. Uh, that we're studying tonight. Micah chapter number 6. He gives them the idea of what to practice. He said, all right, you're in a mess. 
You're wicked as a devil. You're worse than idols. You've forsaken the Lord. Your new moon, your Sabbath are a bunch of junk. I can't even stand to look at them. And look at chapter 6 and verse 3. Oh, my people, what have I done unto thee? Whereon have I wearied thee? Testify against me. Now, the Lord says to them, think about this. The Lord said, what have I, what have I done to y'all that makes you hate me like this? What have I done that makes you want to go worship other gods? I brought you out of Egypt when you wasn't nothing. I get out here and I stab you. Brought you 40 years in the wilderness. I give you a kingdom. I gave you a king. I took care of you. I give you a land of milk and honey. And you've turned and worked. What about, what about, you know, have you ever been full of the devil and real wicked and you felt like the Lord was looking at you and saying, what have I done to you that makes you treat me like this? Son, that'll make you want to crawl under the table. God looks at us and says, have I, have I hurt you? Have I wearied you? Have I been mean? Why are you doing me like you're doing? Why? That's what he's saying to them. See how that fits in our generation also. I can imagine the Lord looks at the United States and says, "What? I blessed you like no other nation has been blessed besides Israel itself. What have I done? Why are, you, why are you lighting a White House up in rainbow colors? Why are you passing laws against directly what I said? What have I done? What have I done to you? Look at chapter number six. What have I done? He said, uh, that you, he said, listen, he said, you never listen. You're constantly living for yourself. You're constantly deliberately disobeying me. You're constantly, maybe he's saying that to you tonight. You're deliberately disobeying him. You're constantly going against his word. You're living like the devil. You're, you're, you're shacking up, you're drinking, you're getting high, you're lying, you're stealing, you won't go to church. And God says, what have I done to you to make me, you treat me like this? Saying to you, ladies and gentlemen, God's been good enough to us that we owe Him everything we have and everything we ever will have. Right. He said, what have I done? Look at verse 4. For I brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. My goodness, I've done everything in the world for you. What, what are you going to do? What, what are we going to do? So, look at verse 8. Tremendous verse now. I looked at verse 7 first. They're all saying there, say to uh, Will the Lord be pleased with a thousand of rams, ten thousand of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for the, my transgression or the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? They said, what am I going to do? Give my kids up? I mean, what do you want me to do? Lord, I, I mean, we're offering sacrifices every day. But look here, this is very important you get this. All this time they were worshiping idols and doing wicked and everything. They were offering them regular sacrifices just like he told them. And God says, hey, them sacrifices are good. But you're wasting your time if you're living like a devil. And you and what they're saying is, my goodness, I go to church every Sunday, get off my back. I ain't, I'm doing pretty good, I think. Why are you mad at me? And the Lord said, I don't care if you live in the church. If your heart ain't right. Look here, verse 8. He has showed thee, old man. This is for everybody in Shining Light Baptist Church tonight. Everybody in the United States. Everybody in the Middle East. He showed you, O oh man, what is good. And what doth the Lord require thee? What is, here's what God wants from you here tonight. To do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. That's what God wants. He said, well, we offer sacrifice every Sunday. We put in our tithes. The Lord said, I want you to love mercy and do right and walk humbly with God. You know what the Lord wants you to do tonight? You know what the Lord wants me to do tonight? The Lord wants me to do justly. That means treat people right. God, I say it again, God will not bless anybody who's mean to people, who tricks, who cheats people, who does people wrong. That ain't right. And God will judge you for that. You better treat people right. You go to school, you better treat people right. Listen, you kids that still go to school, don't be, don't be making fun of people at school. Maybe because of their clothes or maybe because of their looks or maybe don't, that ain't right. Don't, that ain't right. That ain't right. Don't don't be don't be uh, uh, don't don't just drive right by your neighbor when he's got a flat tire there on the side of the road. Do do to other people how you would want them to do you. Do do justly. Love mercy. Don't be so hard. I will tell you one thing: if you ever do me wrong, I'm done with you. I tell you what you better need to do: you need to learn some mercy. There are self righteous bunch of people like that. You come down one of these days when they come, when you hit your when you hit your face in the dirt. 
All these people's always saying, I'd never do this. I'd never do that. You better watch out, buddy, talking like that. You better love mercy. You better love mercy. I'm telling you tonight, brother, we don't, we don't need justice. We need mercy. And he said, walk humbly with our God. Don't stick your chest out and your head in the air like you're something special, like you're some kind of uh, spiritual peacock, brother, walking around better than other people. Uh, he said, walk humbly with our God. Finally, chapter number 7, we're done. The promise. Chapter number 7. We'll look first at around verse number 14. Uh, this is the millennium. The Lord's going to establish righteousness in the millennium. Hezbollah and all them be gone. And uh, feed thy people with thy rod. Now he's going to feed them there in the wilderness. That's prophetic. That's prophetic. In the wilderness, three and a half years, manna, just like he did in the Old Testament. When they're running the Antichrist, feed them. Look at verse number 15. According to the days that I come out of the land of Egypt, I will show you a marvelous thing. Uh-oh. Now, here we go. Here comes Hamas. Here comes those enemies of Israel. You know, them people come from Ishmael. And a lot of times in the Bible, a man's name would mean something and it would follow his kids all the way through history. So when Ishmael was born, you know what God said about him? Ishmael is the father of all the Islamic states. Uh, Iraq, Iran, Sudan, all those are the children of Ishmael. Now the reason you got people like Kim Farrakhan, people like that, all around because they say, we're the children of Abraham too. We're the children of Abraham too. And, those, and they start trying to tell people, say, we're, we're the true children of Abraham. And they are. But the promises of God went down through Isaac, his half-brother, not to Ishmael. And let me tell you what, God, I ain't got nothing personal. I ain't got nothing personal against nobody. I ain't taking up nobody putting out. I'm just, I'm a Bible preacher. That's what I am. My job is to preach the Bible. And I'm telling you what the Bible said. The Bible said that guy, he'll be a wild man. And he said, every man's hand will be against him, and his hand will be against every man. I told Brother back there this morning, uh, I'm not an expert on this stuff, but you hear all this stuff on TV of mean, mean Israel. How can they go in there and kill them? Uh, is, is there mean you? How can you? How you now, best I can understand, it's like this. Hamas headquarters is underneath a hospital. You know why they do that? Because they're chicken. They're scared. They hide behind babies and innocent civilians so that when you finally do kill them, they're like, ah, see there, see there, they're killing civilians. That's so the Western world, the media, will turn against them. That's what that's for. So you got, when, when Israel attacks them, they call ahead, they send messengers ahead, say, look, you better get out of the way. we got to come in here and get these people. they got our hostages. We're going to come in and get them. We don't want to hurt nobody that's innocent. We don't want to hurt no women. We don't hurt no kids. But we got to come in here. And Hamas will say, no, you're not going nowhere because they're using them to shield themselves from Israel. Isn't that something? That's a sorry soldier, ain't it? And they believe they're going to die and go get 15 virgins or whatever. If they really believe that, they'd be killing themselves. Believe that bunch of bull. Listen, y'all. Uh, they 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 hide behind them. So the world, the students. I was telling a young man back there this morning, Gary. I was telling, him, look, and they said, wonder why, wonder why all these students at these colleges and university are saying Israel's bad, Israel's bad. No, Israel, Israel genocide. Why they're killing all this? How many of y'all have heard that at work, or somebody tried to tell you that? Have you seen on the, okay, we've all heard that, and. I think it's this. I think it's a spirit. It's an anti-Semitic spirit. The devil hates that Jew. And the devil hates Israel. You say, well, they're wicked as the devil. I know, I know, I know. I'm not, I'm not saying they're saved. Oh, Netanyahu, they, they don't even believe that Jesus was the Messiah. But they're beloved for the Father's sake. Nationally, as a nation. It's hard to understand, but you've got to get that. So Israel, look, when Hamas came in, they didn't send a message and say, you better get your women and children out of the way. They cut their heads off. Israel's not going in there cutting their heads off. 
indiscriminately. So here's the prophecy on old Hamas. You ready? Here it is in your Bible. Number 16, 716 will be done. The nations shall see and be confounded at all their might. They shall lay their hand upon their mouth, and their ears shall be deaf. Here's Hamas in their tunnels. They shall lick the dust like a serpent. They shall move out of their holes like worms of the earth. There's that 500 miles of tunnels underneath them cities over there. And they shall be afraid of the Lord our God and shall fear because of thee. Who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity and passeth the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He retaineth not his anger forever because he delighteth in mercy. I'm glad of that. I'm glad the Lord delights in mercy. I'm glad the Lord delights in mercy. That's the great God of the Bible. That's the Muhammad delights in mercy. You know what the Lord would love to do for you tonight? He'd love just to show mercy on you and forgive you of everything you've done wrong. He'd forgive every one of them Palestinians. The Lord would love to save any one of them. I don't hate them people. Honestly, I feel sorry for them. I feel sorry, especially for those kids. In the way, that's sad. That's heartbreaking. They're precious. Those little kids and old people and stuff. Uh, we don't. We don't hate them. But one of these days, they're gonna come out of them wormholes, buddy. And the Lord gonna flush them out. And here's what's happening. Going to happen to Israel. Verse 19. He will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities. Thou wilt cast all their sins in the depth of the sea. And I'll show you that here in just a minute in Romans 11. Or seven, yeah, Romans 11. Thou wilt perform the truth to Jacob, not Ishmael. Jacob. There's the 12 tribes. Not Ishmael. Jacob. And the mercy to Abraham, which thou hast sworn our fathers from the days of old. So God is going to have mercy on Israel. Look at Romans chapter 11. And I'm done. On this situation. Romans chapter number 11. Romans chapter number 11. And uh, look at verse 1. This is Paul writing. Verse 1. I say then, has God cast away his people? That's Israel. God forbid. For I also am an Israelite. The seed of Abraham. The tribe of Israel. Not a spiritual Jew. We're all spiritual children of Abraham. He's a literal, physical, visible child of Abraham. Now look at... Uh, uh, chapter 11 and verse 26. 11, 26. And so all Israel shall be saved. That's why some of the old mountain preachers used to preach that Jews didn't have to get saved because they was all saved. He didn't say all Jews. He said all Israel. That's not an individual promise. That's as a nation. As a nation. As it is written, they'll come out of Zion the deliverer and shun godliness from Jacob. Now, one more verse I want to show you. Look at verse 28. 28. As concerning the gospel, our day right now, they, Israel, are enemies. They are beloved for the Father's sake. That's what you've got to understand. The nation, the Israel as a nation. Somebody said, can a Jew be saved now? Absolutely. Any, any Jew in the world, walk in here and get down right there, believe on Jesus Christ, they get saved just like we do. But as a nation, God's whipping the fire out of them right now. But one day he's going to turn again and they'll be saved. All right, I'm done. Turn the cameras off. We'll, anybody want to say something, we'll ask a question, whatever. Uh, you ask a question and I'll 